Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 31. In this episode, we're going to talk to Kirk Evans with the Microsoft Azure Center of Excellence. Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, the only place to stay up to date on everything going on in the Microsoft Cloud world, including Windows Azure, Office 365, SharePoint, Exchange, Link, and related technologies. Just the information, no marketing, no BS. I'm Andrew Connell. And I'm Chris Johnson. And we're just two dudes telling you how we see it. Hello, CJ. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I am wide awake and alive. I had a, <laughs> had a, was out very late at a concert last night, but I am now uh, fully powered. With uh, I'm running on Duncan. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. What you been up to these days? Oh um, well, I had a I had a new version of uh, my trips for Windows Phone go live last night, which has been I, I don't know, up, update the app particularly often, maybe two or three times a year. But this one was kind of a um, it had been a work in progress for a long time, and so it's kind of like a a very uh, a very long needed facelift. So new look and feel and things like that, and finally got it through certification and out to the world so no doubt today will be filled up with my inbox will be filled up with two things it'll be filled up with oh my god this is the best thing since sliced bread and oh my god who moved my cheese i want my old one back (laughs) (laughs) very nice very so that means you've cleared the backlog you can start doing a my trips for ios that we've i've been begging you for is that right yeah strangely enough our friend uh our mutual friend mark rackley uh the javascript god um was on Facebook last night asking me when an Android version came was coming out. And I was like, <laughs> uh, yeah, no. I, uh, I like using good development tools, not uh, punching myself in the face with a screwdriver. Hey, you saw the announcement last week from about Cordova and everything. That could be... No, 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 no. That's HTML and JavaScript. That ain't my bag, baby. Oh, uh, okay. All right, whatever. I don't, want to stick a, I don't want to stick a browser in a native frame on a, on a device. I think it's kind of cool, right? I'm sure some people get it, but... Not me. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Well, cool. Congratulations on that release. Yeah, I think it's a good milestone. What about you? Yeah. Uh, been busy. Been busy. So uh, I guess I did. I have two um, two things that I've uh, written and published in the last week. Uh, one, I guess, one bit of news that we had since the last time we had a show was that um, the Office 365 team has, let's say the right way discontinued the preview program for auto-hosted apps, or the way I like to say it is, they're discontinued, they're dead, they're destroyed, they are no more. I wouldn't quite but, go that far. Well, I just did. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't yeah. have the blue, I don't have the blue badge, you do. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I, 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 uh, I, I definitely get it. That, so that, that's funny, that news, was, uh, that news was out of my team at Microsoft, so I'm kind of near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I have, I have a blog post that I put out about it that, Points to the uh, the blog post that you guys had, a uh, guidance paper that you guys published as well on how to convert a project from auto-hosted, provider-hosted, and then also some code samples. So um, you can go to my blog, check that out. I just made a short link to it of acon.me, that's A-C-O-N-N, acon.me slash auto-hosted, all lowercase. And um, Yeah, I don't think there's many surprises in, in that that was going away. Yeah, it's a good it's a good thing. At least we're not stuck in a limbo of uh, preview program and stuff for perpetual you know, exactly. perpetuity. So. Exactly. And we're going to do something else. So stay tuned. <gasps> Can you announce anything? No. Oh, okay. I try. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing but we want to did... take. We basically the what bottom the bottom line on that one is we want to take all the good stuff from auto hosted, remove all of the bad stuff that people didn't like about it, but make you know give developers what they needed. Ah, very cool. It's a different way. Gotcha. Uh, another thing I did was I a uh, couple uh, about a month or so ago I was a had a, a talk that I gave uh, as a keynote talk at SP TechCon in San Francisco. Um, it was all about you know where I see us in Office 365, where we're going, um, and where how people need to approach it. Uh, and I guess my my gist is that. I think that there's a lot of baggage and a lot of people that are frustrated or or dismiss Office 365 right off the right off the gate, um, but they need and a lot of it's because of the baggage that they've had, and so they need to kind of look at it in a different way. So uh, I just kind of gave some perspective on where we've been, how we got here, where we're going, and all that kind of stuff. And they 
Uh, I took that keynote and wrote an article series out of it that got published over on um, the IT Unity site. Uh, it was published on May the 20th. Um, and uh, the uh, I went through and put a link to it uh, where you can go see more information about it at acon slash me, uh, sorry, acon.me slash 0365 perspective, all lowercase. Um, the other thing, though, that I, I, wanted to, I wanted to kind of touch on was something that was announced last week at TechEd, but you and I didn't spend a tremendous amount of time talking about it. Um, and after the fact, I realized how big of a deal this is, especially for those people who are SharePoint customers and who are doing uh, want to build virtual machines uh, running inside of uh, Azure and IaaS. And that's around the reserved IPs. Um, so that last week, Microsoft announced that with Azure, what they could do is you can now have um, five reserved IPs that you get for free with your account that you can pin to your uh, to different virtual machines in your environment. And so you don't have to have that always on VM anymore to retain a public IP. You can now have oh, just if you had you know, three or four or five VMs, you can reserve a public IP. A, a public IP that will get pinned to that regardless of the VM has been stopped or deallocated. Yeah, nice. Um, so that's big. And if people want more IPs, I think you can get uh, an additional IP for $4 a month or something like that. Gotcha. So, yeah, that's going to be super helpful because everybody's had to leave these little ultra small VMs kicking around to keep the IPs up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's me. I've just been pretty busy the last week. But I, I will share with you one challenge that I'm having right now. That I am, I don't know, as you know, the people who listen to the podcast, you've heard us say that we do this over Skype and we share the videos so we can see each other. And I don't know, CJ, if you can see the um, the flat spot on my head from just beating it on my desk the last few days. <laughs> I thought that uh, was a normally occur- a normal occurrence. <laughs> ah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so get this. So here's my situation. I'm trying to put Azure and 365 together, specifically Azure AD. So what I have is uh, many years ago, I created something called a .NET account that is then a live account and then a Microsoft account. Oh, you mean like one of those Hailstorm accounts? Hailstorm or Hotmail or Live or you name it, right? Microsoft ID. Yeah, it's a Microsoft account. Okay. So I did that. Then a couple years later, Microsoft came out with this thing called Azure. I'm like, hey, that's cool. Let me go create a subscription. It said, use your Microsoft account. So I did that. So I have a Microsoft account. I had changed the email or the primary login to it to my personal email, okay? Which is also like my company email, whatever it is. So when I log in to manage my Azure stuff, I log in using a Microsoft account, which is my person, which is my primary email address. And then mm. a couple of years later, Microsoft came out with this little thing that you might be familiar with called Office 365. Yeah, I've heard of it. So I created a subscription. And I said, hey, I love this thing. Let me move all of my email over to it. So I added my domain, added my yep. email address, and poof. Now when I log into 365, I use my organizational account in Office 365, which happens to have the same user ID. Yeah, so now um, you have a live ID and an org ID, which are like, they look like your primary email address. Yes, they both, they yep. both, the user ID for them is my primary email address. Welcome to identity hell. Oh, no, no, that's, <laughs> that's not so bad. Here's okay. the part where it gets bad. I go over to Azure, right? And we'll and there's a great a great post, and I'll reference it in a little bit. There's a great post that shows you how to go over to Azure, and you say, I want to go over to my Azure subscription, and I want to be able to manage my or link my directory from Office 365, my Azure AD from 365. I want to manage that inside of my Azure subscription. Yep. And so I log in using my Microsoft account to Azure. I go through the process. I add the account. Poof, everything is good. And now I can see all my users from 365 inside of a directory inside of Azure that I could use inside my apps. Yep. Okay. Everything's happy. Except the recommendation from Microsoft is that you want to be able, you want to manage your stuff in Azure using an organizational account and not a Microsoft account. Right? So I go over to my office, to my Azure account, and I say, I want to add in my organizational account, my primary organizational account as an administrator for my Azure subscriptions. But when you go to do that, Mm. the only one it finds is the Microsoft account. It doesn't find the organizational account. And so I can't choose between the two. And so now it looks like my only option is that I have to go create a dummy account inside of 365 
and go log in with that one in order to come over and have an, an organizational account that I can manage my Azure subscription with. But then that kind of defeats the purpose because now I'm logging into 365 with two different IDs just to manage Azure or to check my email. Yeah, I think what you've done here is you've gone to the top of a building and when you were told not to cross the beams, you crossed the beams and now you've got mess. Well, if I look back at it, yes, that would that would that would definitely be true. The problem is is that I was adopting the services as they came out. <laughs> and I was, so Yeah, no, yeah, no, I totally get what you mean. And I, I this, you know, I've heard of, I've heard of lots of folks with uh where they've got the vanity domain thing going on, they've got the custom domain, they've got live ID. They've also got the org ID for 365 and then they open a browser and the first thing they go when they hit the 365 site is brat you're not a valid user, you've got to sign in and you're like, Bingo. Eh? That's a that's a classic uh you know, multi sign in issue. Yeah, it's frustrating, but um I mean it's just it, it's confusing because all this active directory stuff is all very heady and directories and stuff like that, and it's hard to kind of see where everything matches up and so you get it's one of those things you have to put everything else aside, turn the music off, and just read and be like, Okay, let me make sure let me make sure I'm getting down the rabbit hole the right way and so it's confusing, but yeah, whatever. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So anyway, that's my that's my pain right now. But um, hopefully, get it resolved, and if so, I'll update everybody on the on the on the uh, podcast. Hopefully, next podcast. Yeah. Well, I suspect but, there's going to be some. This hopefully, well, not hopefully. I suspect there's going to be some other listeners that are in a similar boat because lots of people went and got their live ID and then gave it like did the whole vanity domain thing with live ID. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and then are going to also stumble into this problem when they also go get a three six five subscription if they do for their own personal use. Yeah, it's just I mean it's a it's something that I I, I know I, I know I've seen a lot of people that have asked about it so it's got to be something in mind for the product group the Azure product group but at any rate. Mm. So anyway, enough of that. So today what we're going to do is uh, we've got a, a guest that we've brought onto the show. Um, who is a brilliant Azure guy. Um, so let me just go through and inter introduce Kirk Evans, who is an architect for the Azure Center of Excellence. Uh, Kirk is a developer and a recovering SharePoint professional. <laughs> <laughs> and Kirk is a frequent speaker at conferences and maintains a very popular, and if I might add, a very resourceful blog at blogs.msdn.com slash K-A-Evans, E-V-A-N-S. So... Kirk, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Absolutely. This is, um, I tell you, for everybody listening, if you're not familiar with Kirk, this is by far one of the, uh, definitely one of the, like, the leaders in terms of like, the technical side of showing you how to do some really, really cool stuff. He's been doing it for SharePoint for many, many years, and the Azure stuff on his blog is incredible. His blog is a, is a wealth of information. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I'm... That's your post, one of your recent posts from roughly a month ago uh, is the one that I'm walking through trying to set up my Azure and 365 ADs together so I can add an app and have everything being trusted by Azure AD. And it's, uh, I'm not banging my head because of your post. I'm banging your head because of something that if had I not been in a certain scenario, I'd be in better shape. I, I got to tell you, whenever I, I know the post you're talking about is one of the ones about adding web API into the Office 365 AD tenancy. Yep. Um, honestly, I, the more I, I look across the identity landscape and see what's going on in the industry and what people are, are doing as far as identity, um, the whole SAML claims thing that we were working on for so long like that that seems to be really kind of down in the you know sharepoint area the rest of the world is doing that exact model mm. it, what's so i would say that once i once i kind of looked at it and then started looking across what are you know what are other platforms doing how do other people do this stuff and i realized holy smokes this is like the way that everybody else in the world does this so uh, i would i would say that um uh, learning OpenID, learning uh, OAuth, it's probably like the two number two number one things. Can you have two number one things? <laughs> <laughs> three, three number one things. <laughs> uh, that I think developers really need to understand those two technologies. It is so, so it is so confusing too. I was going to say because I think it's really hard for people to grasp that thing. 
I was just going to say before we before we dive into the weeds, why don't we like, what is this Azure Center for Excellence thing? Right, you work for Microsoft, right? Yes, sir, I do. And then, and then, which bit of Microsoft? Interesting. Um, <laughs> let me. <laughs> I always have a hard time. So, I, truthfully, I report up through Microsoft Consulting Services. Um, gotcha. Our, okay. our group is actually kind of funded by two different groups within Microsoft, the Azure product team and then MCS. So we report officially through MCS, but we have this kind of dual master role where we also have some responsibility back to the Azure product team as well. Gotcha. I see. I see. And so what's the like so the Azure Center of Excellence, what's your what's the kind of the goals for the team and what's what's the what's the stuff that you guys work on? I am a technical pre-sales architect for MCS. So as customers are looking at building some interesting new scenario, and we have some consultants who are out talking to the uh, talking to the customer and trying to figure out what's possible, I would be one of those guys that comes in and says, you know, here's here's some things to think about. Here's the here's how I would probably architect this. And then part of my job is to try to keep as current on Azure as possible. All, all the recent announcements, um, you know, obviously we learn a lot about those before the public uh, learns about them. So we sign up for the internal previews and we start kicking the tires on as much of this stuff as we can. So as soon as the customer hears about it, they get interested and they, you know, I want to learn more about resource groups. I want to learn more about Azure website slots. And we have gotcha. to be prepared to be able to have those conversations really, really quickly. I see. I see. It's that difference Excellent. of not having the three-year release cadence anymore. Yeah, isn't it glorious? You know, it you is. have to be. It's you, have actually, to be you, you can't just sort of. Uh, you can't just sort of get drunk on news once every three years. <laughs> you gotta. You gotta dip in every week or every day, almost. It seems. Yeah, you couldn't just learn .NET two and ride on that for three years, right? <laughs> totally. And to be fair, you know, of all of the groups at Microsoft that are completely nailing this, it's Azure, right? Azure are just smashing it and uh, banging it out of the park, so to speak. Oh, my is that goodness. The right word? Or is that a Kiwiism? Knocking it out of the park is the right word, no. right? Banging um, it out of the park? <laughs> well, no, the banging bit was the Kiwiism. Maybe it was knocking that I should have been using. I've but, had um, jokes. Let's move on. <laughs> just, <laughs> okay, yeah, let's not get into the bashing the Kiwis. Sheep. <laughs> 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 so you say, it, Kirk, you say that you're not doing, you're not Knocking doing it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. No, I'm not doing SharePoint stuff really at all anymore. Um, I, Why you disappoint I, me, Kirk Evans? Why you disappoint me? <laughs> well, what, what a lot of our customers are asking for is I want to host SharePoint on Azure IaaS. And so I spend a lot of time trying to talk customers down off that ledge a little bit and say, you know, there's Office 365. That's going to scale, give you a better experience. You know, let's let's look at what are the capabilities. And a lot of customers really don't know about hybrid capabilities. And mm. so I spend a, a bit of time talking about just basic hybrid connectivity, IaaS, what, we, what can you do with site-to-site VPNs and, and now the new regional VPN connectivity mm-hmm. um, Trying to discuss a lot of those concepts with customers, a lot of them just aren't familiar with more than, I have a virtual machine in the cloud, now what? So a lot of customers are really looking at Azure as the dumping ground for the stuff that they don't want to run on-prem anymore. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of time trying to educate them around, um, you know, let's up-level the conversation of what are your business goals and what are the things that you're trying to achieve rather than just dumping SharePoint out in the cloud. Totally. I think they feel like it's, I, th- I think they, that that is kind of the natural progression from on-prem is to take, you know, your images and dump them somewhere else. And for no other reason than it's a more known quantity to them, right? That they're used to VMs rather than really thinking about the bigger problem, which is, you know, what, what are they trying to solve? And, um, and does it really solve it for them by doing that? In fact, I, th- I think, if anything, it probably creates a new set of problems that they hadn't mm. necessarily considered. So that's a lot of what I, I spend a lot of time talking with customers, trying to understand what are their actual business objectives, what are the things that they want to do. And I mean, I'll admit, 
Um, I'm supposed to be technical pre-sales for MCS, but remember, I also have that dual role over to the Azure group. I don't want to, um, my, my boss is Steve Fox. And so one of the, for the, those who don't know, Steve has been in the community a long time, has spoken mm-hmm. a lot of conferences and about SharePoint stuff. One of his, one of my favorite terms for his is breaking you into jail. Um, so we don't necessarily want to break customers into jail by you know doing something that later on they may not be as happy with as if we yeah. invested in the time to do the right thing right now. Yeah, well, gotcha. It seems. I mean, I've, I've always kind of looked at at IaaS, the the IaaS offering inside um, Azure, and I mean, even on the competing cloud products, it's it's really kind of a stopgap where where we are today. I mean, a lot of people want to move things to the cloud, but then they have a lot of these different applications that they can't move to the cloud because they're not designed for the cloud. And so the easiest way to do it is just to create a virtual machine in the cloud, get out of the hardware maintenance business and push stuff up into the cloud using virtual machines. But the future of kind of where we want to go in the cloud is being able to have either a software as a service like Office 365 that you can subscribe to, or you want to be as a developer, you're building applications. You want to do things with the PaaS model, more of a platform as a service and leverage things like Service Bus and websites and SQL Azure, uh, Azure SQL databases. <laughs> and sorry, the naming changes way too often to keep it straight. <laughs> I've got it straight. Just I stumble every once in a yep. while. But yeah, I mean, it just the, the IS stuff is that I like. I like that term of, of breaking into jail because you're simply just kind of moving the cheese from one problem over to another problem, and you're still going to ultimately probably want to get out of that maintenance of SharePoint um, down the road. And and that's I mean. I, while there are going to be customers that are that are in that situation where they cannot go to 365 for for certain regulatory or uh, geographic or whatever issues, um, at least it is a good a good option for them to have kind of that in between kind of uh, purgatory. Well, that's a bad way to say it, probably in between <laughs> kind of like staging ground. Well, don't, don't get me wrong; I, it, there are plenty of use cases for using IaaS. Um, mm. At public facing internet sites, if you want to use SharePoint for that, that can be a real pain in the ass to do if you're trying to do that in your own data center mm. because the Active Directory dependency. A lot of companies can't get past the fact of, holy smokes, I can't have a read only domain controller. And I, you mean I have to have a writable, writable domain controller accessible from the DMZ? Um, so a lot of customers can't get past that part. Well, Putting an isolated uh, directory out in Azure and then managing that through the port forwarded uh, endpoints, perfect, perfect example of that's something that you really can do. And now you can use the content deployment, cross-site publishing, and all those other capabilities to push that content to that to that farm out in the cloud or direct authoring, yeah, all the all the WCM capabilities that O365 doesn't have today. Cool. Well, so you you mentioned a second ago. Let's I mean, kind of pivoting a little bit off the SharePoint space um, a bit. But you you mentioned a bit ago that you know you were well, you're a recovering SharePoint professional. You're not doing much SharePoint stuff anymore. But yeah, you can tell I'm still in recovery because I just you, fell back on the SharePoint discussion there real quick. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it it brings up something else because I you know, I've seen content on your blog recently. You talk about it um, about working with the Office 365 APIs and it kind of looks at more like the where I'm, I'm seeing more of SharePoint going from it being, you know, a separate product in and of itself, where it's really just seen as, look, this is just another service that 365 has to offer, like email, like uh, presence, like directory, like social and stuff. And now we have these APIs where you can tie in to more of your cloud kind of company with 365s, uh, or 365 and being able to build things that are going in Azure. I mean, you've done a, you've done a, a bunch of work in this space uh, lately, haven't you? Or is that... Yeah, the the coolest thing that our group is working on is a solution accelerator. Um, a solution accelerator in, in Microsoft Consulting is basically a a set of code. It's not not a demo. It's something that actually is a functional solution that our consultants then can either repurpose, reuse, or just take parts of it or just take inspiration from. But the whole idea is to accelerate. Um, the engagement so that they can hit the ground running really quickly. And the solution accelerator that I own right now is uh, one called Mobile Workforce. And the idea is 
Um, you have a, a company that has workers that are out in the field with occasionally connected devices. And we all know that you know, it's not just one device anymore. I mean, uh, CJ, as, as much as you don't want to program Android, you're going to need to learn it. <laughs> um, whether it's phone gap or, or, or if you're going native, whatever. But and I think that's probably the number one scenario that a lot of customers are facing right now is enabling that bring your own device strategy. Um, enabling secure connection to their own data and being able to secure that in a way, but also recognizing the fact that as much as my wireless might work great in my house right now, it doesn't necessarily work great a mile down the road. Right. So we need to be able to handle things like offline sync, and we also need to be able to secure things through you know using things like Azure Active Directory and registering applications. And that's why the O365 APIs are so just flipping unbelievably cool. Because you're right, I can go build my own web API and I can secure it with Azure AD. And then I can create a Windows 8 app or an Android app or iOS app or you know Windows phone app. I, I, could, I have all these different types of clients. Even my website, instead of having my website talking directly to the data store, I probably want to have my website just be another client to that web API so that I can reuse that, te- reuse that same logic layer across all these different client applications. Mm. That's why O365 is so cool to me because you're right. At that point, it becomes just another endpoint to me. And that's what I think is so unbelievable is how many times when you're writing applications do you write scheduling or calendar or mm. messaging or um, you, know, you need to save a, save a file somewhere? All of those are right there in the Office 365 preview APIs right now. And I can only imagine that they're going to expand on this to include full breadth of O365 services. I think that that becomes one of the uh, pillar capabilities for building these occasionally connected apps. And then couple that with all the stuff that the Azure team is doing to make that scenario dead simple uh, through mobile services. Holy smokes. That is that is geek porn. <laughs> <laughs> so why do you say that? Why why do you say why do you say mobile services is geek porn? Oh my god! This is, this is Azure mobile services you're talking about, right? Yeah, it, okay. using yeah Azure Azure mobile services. I should use the right name. Um, all right, so think about all the different things I just talked about. There's Azure AD, and then there's a web API, and then there's a client. Um, and then in when you have these things, you're also going to need storage. So you're probably going to have a SQL Azure database. Well, <laughs> instead of you having to build all of those things and figure out the connectivity and the storage of keys and all that other stuff, you just go to, this is so unbelievably cool to me, you just go to Azure, uh, Azure Mobile Services and you say, here's my mobile service, here is going to be my table, double click, and it creates the freaking client for you the web api for you and it can all can integrate with azure ad it, it should and Whoa. when you do that it also includes the offline sync through the sdk and it's not just windows uh, that's one of the coolest things you go look at the azure mobile services and across the board uh, windows technology is one of the least represented it, it has everything from uh, from PhoneGap, which is uh, akin to the Cordova stuff that we talked about before. Um, and just to make it even cooler, the um, the when they released the Cordova uh, tools for O365 the other day, that integrates extremely easily with Azure Mobile Services. So hmm. using JavaScript inside of a Cordova app, can then talk to O365 APIs that can also integrate with your Azure mobile services extremely easily. There's plenty of documentation and samples that show how to do it. So CJ, you could have that new Xamarin client, or I'm sorry, new Android client, um, using PhoneGap for my trips really, really easily. Yeah, nice. No, it's, I, I'm, I've been really impressed with just how it manages to wire up so much of the plumbing for you mm. without you having to learn like, Every single, every single little piece of the technology along the way, and exactly how it all hangs together behind the scenes. It's it's awesome how that's 
it's come a long way in the last couple of years, maybe two year and a half or so since it pr- came out, something like that. Yeah, one of the one of the biggest things that they introduced, and, and to be fair, it doesn't necessarily automatically generate an app that will fit your data your data schema. It, it actually just generates a sample to do item. Uh, mm-hmm. application that you can then quickly change but some of the things that it it, it includes is uh, dynamic schema uh, dynamic schematization I guess this is the term that they use where I can just throw some JSON data at the service and then it'll automatically map that to some tables create some columns for me and then I get the the data stored in in that table it's just that part is just kind of mind-boggling when you look at some capabilities of you know contract versioning and a lot of that problem goes away. Is that is that kind of like looking at it? it would a, would a good analogy of that being like kind of a code first with migrations with entity framework and databases, but yep. doing it on the mobile side and throwing JSON at it, and it does the whole back end uh, uh, arc, uh, schema and architecture and everything for the infrastructure. Yes, sir. Holy crap! Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, and you just look at it and you're just like. Oh, wow, that was so ridiculously simple that the bulk of my work was not focused on, okay, here's my table, here's the types, let me write all the SQL statements and all that junk. You don't do any of that stuff. You just go to the client and you just throw up some uh, you just throw up some JSON at the at your web API, boom. And uh, everything just kind of magically happens. It and then you can control things on the back end using either node um, so you can write some JavaScript to control different different points of when your API is called. You can, and that's how you can also do things like um, add in Azure AD to do authorization, authentication of users. I mean, just the the capabilities there are just ridiculous. And then for those customers who don't want that dynamic schematization, you can you can still control the API at whatever layer you need. So it, the flexibility and the, the number of capabilities that it provides, it, it, and the fact that the SDK itself is kind of sp- spans everything, I- including Windows, but also Xamarin, PhoneGap, and Node, and every all these other different technologies, that part is just, the. I think, that's where the Azure team is really knocking it out of the park, is the fact that, you know, all their documentation is up on GitHub. Their samples are up on GitHub. And all the samples that they put up on the portal, even the stuff that they automatically generate, iOS, Android, you know, they just include everything, including Windows. I think that part is really cool. That's, yeah. yeah. So you, you say it's up in GitHub. Where, like, where can they go to find information about it? Uh, like the GitHub account, or is it a specific repository, or is it just they have an account, or, or what? Uh, just go to Azure.com. And mm-hmm. when you go to Azure.com and you scroll to the bottom of any page that's on document, any of the documentation pages, you'll see at the bottom where it says, uh, "Go to the GitHub repository." Uh, that I, that is one of the coolest. Okay, so now I know what you're talking about. That that is one of the coolest things I'm seeing the Azure team do in terms of being so open with stuff where they've got. Yeah. So for everybody who hasn't seen this, like Kirk just said, if you go to Azure.com, go to any of the documentation pages and scroll to the bottom, you'll see a little GitHub icon. Um, what you can do is every single document in the Azure documentation is inside of a repository where you can go in in GitHub. You can first you can get a local copy of it if you wanted to. It doesn't. I don't know why you would want that, but if you wanted to, you can get it. But what's really cool about it is that if you want to propose some additional changes to it, or you see there's an error in the document, or you want to provide a sample or something, you can go in fork it, make a change to it, submit a pull request over. There's a steward over on the Azure side that's looking at the content that's coming in and will maybe push that kind of stuff back into the main documentation that'll show up on the Azure website. I, I've been there's a uh, I've been with somebody on the SharePoint team, uh, actually somebody on your team, CJ, I've been pushing this really hard to saying this is what we need for the SharePoint and 365 side mm-hmm. is to take what we have in MSDN and in TechNet push those two things together and to have that kind of community kind of contribution of uh, being able to, to put the content in there instead of having those th- and, and having like the comments on discuss and, or, and having comments on discuss, not instead of, yeah. Um, yeah. To really making the documentation where it's still driven by Microsoft and it's still managed by Microsoft, but opening it up and saying, yeah, anybody can go through it. If you got some stuff to share, come on in here and share this stuff. Yeah. It makes it it's- everybody's uh, everybody's, everybody's all in it together and, and making it better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really cool. The Azure guys are just 
the, the way that they're innovating, the way that they're pushing stuff out. I, I, I share the excitement that you got there, Kirk, but you're, it's very obvious how interested it is right now. You know what? From- I've been with Microsoft 10 years this March. Um, even just I, two years ago, I could not have fathomed this this uh, this type of openness. It just it is mind boggling as this as as a Microsoft veteran, having seen this whole fight you know against open source, the uh, the general okay, well we're not going to really do open source. We'll create our own open source through CodeFlex. I I know that's not really the story, but still yeah. that uh, there's a lot of community perception around that. And while a lot of the community is, you know, really gravitated towards GitHub and and open source, there's still large factions of Microsoft that are still trying to figure out, whoa, what what just happened? And here's the Azure team. Just uh, excuse me, guys, can y'all step aside because we're just like racing down here and and doing the right thing. It's just it's just really amazing to see that. I I've, I've been saying this a lot in Twitter. It is the new Microsoft. It it is it is just stunning to watch what's happened just in the past year to 2 years. So let me ask you about that then. Um you say year to 2 years and that to me kind of coincides with the time that Scott Guthrie came over on the Azure side, which he did amazing things everywhere everywhere he's been. It's just like Hey, we're gonna put you over here, and it's like, ding, it's gold. Okay, let me come over here. Let me. What are you gonna do over here? Ding, that's gold now. Okay, so we're gonna put reason, you over the Azure side. There's a reason that he has the position he has now. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it, it's. It, I was gonna ask you. Do you think that that's is that driven a lot by, you know, him moving over onto the Azure side? Um, do you see a lot of that from coming one to two years? So obviously, it's not coming from specifically from top down from the CEO side in the last two to three, four or five months since um, such as has taken over Microsoft, Microsoft. But um, I mean, I'm sure he's had some involvement or some influence with it too, because he came from the Azure side. So, I mean, it, this is, I, I get, it's part of the question, but I guess I'm part kind of just um, editorializing a bit. That's one of the things, this is one of the things that makes me have such a better uh, outlook and being so much more bullish on Microsoft after, you know, for a couple of years kind of being, a little bit more on the like sour, kind of in the dumps, a little bit on Microsoft and the direction they were going, was that the people that are running the ship now, the people that have the keys to the kingdom, are the ones that have been driving this crazy innovation, this crazy openness, this rapid release cadence, and everything with Azure. Those are the guys that have the keys to the kingdom now for the entire company. I I wish that I had better insight to to give you a better comment other than that sounds great. <laughs> Um, the truth is that there's been an army of people who have been heads down working on this for years mm. and discounting the fact that those people, you know, you're seeing the fruits of a lot of innovation now that has been in the works for a number of years. So to say that, it, you know, Satya came in and turned the company around and inside that brief amount of time. I don't know how true that is because a lot of that Steve had to set in motion for it all to be announced within the past couple months. No, Steve Ballmer. Yeah, and that, I, 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 yeah, I would definitely. I don't. I don't mean to imply that this has been, you know, something that's been all of a sudden the last six months. All of a sudden, it's like, hey, guess what? We're going to pivot. Well, I get, I get a, a, the opposite side of the coin is, holy smokes, the past couple of months have been really damn fun. So, <laughs> <laughs> I love that Microsoft has a swagger that I haven't seen in a while, and so I, it, I think, I think the biggest change that I think the biggest change, especially coming from on the Azure side, is they're not afraid. Uh, they haven't been afraid to break from the norm and break stuff internally. And I don't mean the bits, right? I mean Azure's solid as, but I mean like just break the way stuff is done inside of Microsoft to re to reinvent uh, themselves and do things differently. And that that to me is the real key. Right. They haven't been afraid to go piss people off and do things differently. Uh, and um, and to make the you know, to make their products better and to make the way they work with the community better and and the whole nine yards and that 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 I that I think is starting to permeate a lot more now with uh, with uh, with the goo at the helm of uh, of a lot more and uh, the same with Sacha. Hmm. Yeah, I'd, I I absolutely agree and I you know I'd, there was a time where I almost felt. A, um, a tinge of apology in my voice whenever I told people I work for Microsoft, 
and you know it, immediately it was always the jokes about oh can you fix my printer or um, I want to go you know want to go back to Windows XP I really don't like the uh, Vista or whatever I mean there was that dark period of employment where a lot of Microsoft people were kind of questioning wow where where are we going and then really since the release of Windows 8 um, you know love it or love it or, or not. Um, the, it made a palpable change, and that was a that was an inflection point to say, "Here's where we're going to go," and it may not be popular now, but it's kind of the right thing to do. And at the at the time, uh, I think that was kind of the uh, you're saying the one to two years. Honestly, I think that was about it. The release of Windows eight. It was, um, you know, okay, this may not be something that everybody really likes. We'll make some changes. We'll, we'll listen to feedback, and we'll make gradual improvements. But I, I honestly think that um, the company's focus on unifying the platform, getting alignment between Xbox and, and, and Windows and phone, and becoming, you know, and recognizing that we're changing strategic direction from a monolithic licensing company to a, a devices and services company. There were so many different changes that happened all at that one inflection point. I think that it was making the the conscious decision of we're going to be a devices and services company. We're going to focus on subscription models. We're going to enable O365 subscriptions and, and Azure subscriptions, and less on the on the uh, on the you know recurring EA type of model. I, that was probably the the number one uh, big big change in my opinion. Very cool. That's it's cool to hear a different another perspective on it, especially somebody from the inside that's been you know living in the Azure space and stuff. It's been a lot of fun uh, to be involved with Azure over the last few years and really seeing how things are just getting pushed out over and over. And it's I guess one of the I'm back to the point of where I'm now you know eagerly watching keynotes live because <laughs> I want to see what they're talking about at TechEd and. At build and it's like going here's what we're doing next and here's what we're doing next and it's like going oh my god are you I, I love the slide that has the here's how much data we have in azure now and here's how many authentications are going on and oh yeah somebody screwed one little thing up and we actually supported three billion authentications in one day or something it's like going, oh my god <laughs> yeah. you, support that? you know i was so yeah sitting at build and uh and and i tweeted mary joe foley because i was like hey you missed out the 365 news that was in the keynote like the around the apis and stuff and she was like this just too much to tweet <laughs> <laughs> well all right so kind of kind of wrapping up because i realized we've been going for a while um I saw a discussion between some of the uh, SharePoint MVP folks saying, you know, there's just so much innovation and, you know, are developers keeping up and is there any value? And, and then pretty quickly the answer came back was, holy smokes, there's so much coming out. This is so exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a giant fire hose coming out of Redmond right now how much you decide to take the entire stream or just the parts that you need right now, that's the coolest thing is you don't have to go out and be a complete Azure specialist. You can go just go pick the couple bits that fit your scenario, whether it's going to be uh, you know machine to machine or internet of things, or if you're going to go into uh, you know big data or if you want to go into occasionally connected and and you know using more of the PaaS side, there's so many different opportunities that are out there to leverage to focus on business scenarios, and that's kind of the coolest thing is that there is like an entire new platform of Microsoft stuff. It's not just BizTalk, SQL, Dynamics, SharePoint, Office. It, it there's like this entire new company of products that has come out that you can pick and choose from that to fit your business solutions. I, I completely agree with you. I, it's very much to me, it's very much like the SharePoint space where you would look at somebody and they would come or a company would come to you and they say, can you do this? You're supposed to be a SharePoint expert. And you're like, no, 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 this product is way too big. <laughs> I personally, like speaking for myself, I've never touched BI inside SharePoint. I've got resources. I know where to go to, to find information about it. I know who to call, but I have never touched it. Why? Because the product is so big. A DR scenario, I've never done it. I got a guy that does it for me. I focus on the dev and I focus on specific parts inside SharePoint and extending it. And I reach out to somebody else. Same thing with Azure. 
You can't put every shiny toy in every single product, in every single project. It's not smart. It's not practical. And you just focus on what you've got, just kind of working this thing. As long as you're not breaking into jail and, and, and trying to invest and buy into something that is an older technology and you mean not like the hotmail address? They, oh boy. <laughs> Speaking of jail. If I could hit the reset button, I would do it in a minute. Trust me. <laughs> There's a way that I could move stuff around. I'd do it in a second. But um, Hey, we all inhaled. <laughs> yeah, but only some of us exhaled. <laughs> so, all right. Well, cool. Hey, Kirk, thank you very much for, for you know sharing your thoughts and um, talking about from your perspective from the Azure space and the center of excellence uh, and how it all relates to what we're all doing today. So I'm, I'm sure the listeners got a lot out of this. Um, so thank you very much. And we'll have to bring you back another time to talk a little bit more about these the mobile services. It sounds like that's a whole nother thing that we could dive into uh, to have a much, much deeper discussion on it. Geek porn. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, thanks, Kirk, for coming along. Um, hey, AC, before we wrap this up, uh, we got a new five-star review in iTunes. Whoop, whoop. Let's, uh, let's put the sound or the foghorn sirens in the, uh, on the recording here because this is epic. Uh, this is titled A+, plus, bang, bang, or um, exclamation, not bang, bang, but bang is anyway. Uh, by Skippy Cheap. PGD, <laughs> and uh, he says, great content and re- and very relevant info on cloud technology. <laughs> AC and CJ provide great consumable and current content. Only downside is I wish they did more recordings. My God, Skippy PGD, more recordings every week is not enough for you, huh? <laughs> I don't know. There is... I will give you a PayPal account, my friend. We will yeah. most happily take donations and we will do more recordings and we will talk more. But love thank the, you uh, very, very much. Yeah, love the enthusiasm and uh, and thank you for the review. Super helpful to get the feedback. But uh, I don't, yeah, you know, weekly is probably as, as often as we're going to do it for now, unless something drastic changes. But appreciate the feedback. Yeah, that's awesome feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cool. Well, it's been a great discussion. Uh, I guess we will have to, we will go on to the next show next time. Yeah, thanks, AC. Thank you very much, everyone. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a wave or an MP3 file and provide a link so that we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is an excerpt from Evaporated Eric by Monk Turner used under Creative Commons. You can subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find a full transcript and show notes of each episode. You can find us on Facebook searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.